Well, we continue our six-part series looking at the Christmas story through various perspectives, various windows. In week one, we talked about the window of exaltation and talked about angels. Week two, we talked about the window of wonder and talked about Mary. Last week, we talked about the window of worship and talked about the shepherds. This week, we look through the window of obedience and talk about Joseph. Joseph could have turned and just walked away. Instead, he undertook willingly and obediently what probably in the world was the most difficult of all tasks, be the stepfather for the Son of God. Just think about that. Joseph was obedient at great personal cost, choosing to be what he didn't have to be. And it all began, just like it did with Mary and just like it did with the shepherds, with an angelic visitor in a dream. And that sets the tone for Joseph's obedience to be seen, even though Joseph was obviously obedient before that. But we can see four areas of his obedience in Scripture, and that's where we're going today. First, Joseph was obedient to angelic instructions. Now, based on tradition... And based on the culture of the time, we can estimate that Joseph was probably significantly older than Mary. One, it was the custom of the time for 14 or 15-year-old young women to marry older men, as well as Joseph is not present at all during the Gospels um, of Jesus' public ministry. When Jesus was 30 to 33 and a half years old, I mean, there's references to Jesus being the carpenter's son, but he's he's not present. So most likely Joseph was dead at that particular time. Now the betrothal that Joseph and Mary had, it was pretty serious. It was legally binding. Unlike engagements today when one person just says, hey, listen, you know what? I know we've got the invitations on the coffee table and I know we paid lots of money for those rings that we financed for, you know, another four or five years, but I don't want to get married. And that's basically the end of it, as long as you can duck the, you know, the right hooks and the, those kinds of things. But today, it's easy to get out of. But in the first century, it wasn't. It was legally binding. Now, I want you to imagine Joseph for a moment. I want you to imagine Joseph's heartache when he heard that Mary, his pure, his godly young fiance, was pregnant. Her apparent betrayal must have rocked his world. I mean, how could she do this? And who was the man who participated in such a betrayal? But one of the things that's interesting, and I'm going to give you two of those things that you may have never thought about before in today's sermon. Here's one of them. What's interesting is we are not told that Joseph had any contact with Mary personally about this matter. Now, we've assumed that Mary is the one who told Joseph, hey, I'm pregnant. But I think that's our 21st century culture speaking. If you go back into the first century and you think about the role of dads in the first century, it's very likely that it was Mary's father who ashamedly approached Joseph with the news. That's probably how it happened. And once Joseph knew Mary was pregnant, he was faced with some decisions. It's Matthew who fills in the blanks for us, fills in the gaps, fills in the holes for us, and shows us this window of Joseph's quiet character. Man, I want to be more like Joseph. Listen to this in Matthew 1. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. If Mary's pregnancy got out, Joseph would be publicly humiliated after they realized Joseph wasn't the father. He would have been the object of pity. He would have been the object of ridicule. And yet his concern is not about himself. He's not concerned about that. His response is not one of revenge. His response is not one that demands justice. He could have demanded that Mary be stoned for adultery, for violating their betrothal. 
And although there was no sexual relations between a bride and a groom during that betrothal period, if they were going to end that betrothal period, it required a certificate of divorce. But Joseph wasn't concerned about himself. Joseph looked for ways not only to obey the law of Moses, but Joseph looked for ways to protect Mary. Man, what a, what a great guy. As Joseph wrestled with this dilemma, and he apparently decided the end, to, to end the betrothal period, to end their engagement quietly, during that time, he received a special message, most likely from the same angel that talked to, Gabriel, uh, talked to Mary, which was Gabriel. But in this particular instance, this angel shows up in Joseph's dream, and the angel is not named. But this is what happens. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, the word considered means that Joseph took a lot of time. He was in deep thought. He had meditated on what he was going to do. And an angelic messenger with a heavenly message is no small thing. And the elements of this message that this angel gives to Joseph has overwhelming significance. Huge. Joseph has a position as a descendant of great King David. The Holy Spirit was the source of Mary's pregnancy. The child's name would be Jesus. The child's purpose was to save people from their sins. And the child's birth would be a fulfillment of prophecy in Scripture. Man, that is great news. Amen? Amen. But with that good news came some bad news. Who on earth is ever going to believe that? Verse 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Obedience was Joseph's response to a deeply difficult life situation. Let me repeat that. Joseph's response to a deeply difficult life situation was obedience. From the front of the stage all the way to the back, from the right to the left, every single one of us, we've either gone through a very difficult period in our life, we're going through one right now, or we're getting ready to go through one. And Joseph serves as a great example of what we should do. We should be obedient, obedient to God. And this is not the only time that he was obedient, and it wasn't the only time that it was a hallmark for his life. Not only did he obey angelic instructions, but... Joseph was obedient to human government. We need this lesson in the 21st century. Rome ruled with absolute authority. And either you submitted to that power or you absolutely got crushed. The events surrounding Christ's birth serves as an impressive reminder that human government does not operate in a vacuum. It does not operate independently. There is a divine orchestration of the events of human history. That is true in the 21st century. It is, was also true in the 1st century as the stage was set to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Listen to verses 1 through 5 from Luke 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, I want you to notice the political heavyweights that are involved here. Caesar Augustus. He ruled Rome, the entire known world. And then Quirinius, who ruled a chunk of that world. Yet both of them were ruled by God. Both of them were subject to the king of heaven and earth. Now listen, I don't care whether you're right, left, happy, sad, depressed, ecstatic about the current situation in our politics. The fact of the matter is all that has to go through the sovereignty of God. 
And God has a plan. You may not be happy with how it's unfolding. You may be ecstatic about how it's unfolding. But the fact of the matter is, human government is set up by God himself. And just like in the first century, there was a plan. Trust me when I tell you, there's a plan in the 21st century too. The entire world was placed in motion so that Mary would be where she needed to be, so that Christ would be born where he needed to be in fulfillment to the prophecies. And Joseph followed the edict to the letter by going to Bethlehem and being counted in the imperial census. It reveals the heart of a man who has complete obedience and loyalty to God. The God who has given us instructions on how to deal with human authority. It's an indication of a heart that recognizes the function of authority and accepted it. And as a result Joseph, of Joseph's obedience, guess where the Son of God was born? Born in Bethlehem, right where Micah had predicted hundreds of years before it happened. That's who our God is. So Joseph was obedient not only to an angelic instruction, he was also obedient to human government, but, but he was also obedient to God's word. Listen to these verses. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angels had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with it what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons." We see Joseph's involvement next in this story that he's got a responsibility. It, it's, it's his responsibility to take care of this. The Mosaic laws, all the do's and the don'ts and the shall and the shout nots and the sh- sh- shants. I mean, if you're King James Version, you know, I mean, all, all those things that you had to do and you, all those things in Leviticus, all those things in Deuteronomy, all those things in Exodus, I mean, all those laws, they had to be observed. All those things set forth in the Old Testament. And one of those things was that every Jewish male had to be circumcised on the eighth day of their life. This kept them separate and distinct, God's people, from the pagan cultures that surrounded them. But also there was a sacrifice that was necessary for the purification of a new mother, which would have happened at day 40. Now, just like the shepherds were unclean because of their contact with birthing lambs, blood, so a mother would have come in contact with blood during the birthing process, and that would have made her unclean. So they went to Jerusalem to take care of these things. And the fact that Mary and Joseph offered doves or pigeons as a sacrifice shows that they were not of means. They were not wealthy. A lamb was required by those who were wealthy, but that would come later, wouldn't it? The Christ who would bring all of the law to its truest and complete fulfillment. Jesus followed in the footsteps of his earthly father who took obedience to God seriously. In all he did, Joseph exemplified a spirit of submission. And God expects his children, he expects us to exhibit that spirit of submission as well. He was obedient to angelic instructions. He was obedient to human government. He was obedient to God's word. And he was also obedient to a heavenly warning. Now, before Joseph's final appearance in the scriptures, when Jesus is 12 years of age, when they go to the temple and accidentally leave Jesus behind, I'm sure Joseph heard about that. You know, you, you, you got him? Uh, well, I thought he was with you. I mean, Mary probably took a broomstick to Joseph at that particular moment. But anyway... Before he shows up on the last pages of the Bible, he's faced with two more decisions to do what is right, to to obey or to disobey. And of course, we know that he obeyed. Listen to this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. 
So after these mysterious strangers showed up on the doorstep, and by the way, if you just spent hundreds of dollars on your brand new nativity set, I'm going to bust your bubble. You are going to have to take those wise men out of the living room and you're going to have to put them in the kitchen because they were not there the night Jesus was born. They did not see Jesus in the manger. They were not there. They saw his star that night, but the fact of the matter is they had to travel and they showed up at a house. They walked in. They were not there at the nativity. So go ahead and move them on top of the refrigerator and just deal with that, okay? But the fact of the matter is this, Joseph receives this visitation in a dream again from an angel and you can read about it in Matthew 2, 13 through 18. We don't have time to go through the scripture today. But this angel warns that the baby is in danger because Herod's on the warpath. And that would have never occurred to Joseph and Mary that this child of theirs, that Herod was after this baby. Well, after the angel appeared to Joseph and told them to flee to Egypt, only then did Joseph realize their world was far more dangerous than what they realized for their baby boy. And Joseph didn't hesitate. They couldn't stay in Bethlehem, so Joseph takes them to Egypt. And then after fleeing to Egypt, this is what happened. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, "'Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel.' For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. Now, I need to give you some little bit of history dates. The person who came up with our calendar got this all wrong. Jesus was not born in year zero. There is no year zero, okay? He was born before Herod died. Now, how he messed this up on the calendar, I have no idea. He should be fired. The fact of the matter is, Herod died in 4 B.C., and Jesus was born before Herod died. So Jesus was probably born in four, early 4 BC or 5 BC. And so we need to understand that when you, when you go to the calendar, we're, we're you know, back four or five years. And on a human level, when it comes to Joseph's willingness to obey an angel's warning, it provided one of the very early escapes of many that Jesus was going to experience. But when we look at the story, When we look at this story through Joseph's perspective, what do we see? We see a constant heart of obedience. He responds obediently to each challenge set before him. It shows us the wisdom of taking God seriously, and it shows us the folly of self-determination. The fact is, God is sovereign, and we are not. Joseph chose to live a life of obedient trust in a world that discourages long-term commitment in favor of just instant gratification. But Joseph leaves us an example that's well worth following. Now, I told you there was two things that you'd never had maybe thought about before, and here's the second one. Do you know that in all of Scripture, Joseph never says a word? There's not one time in Scripture where Joseph, I'm talking about Joseph of the New Testament, not Joseph of the Old Testament. Mary's husband, not one time where he's quoted as saying anything. We got Mary. We got the disciples. We got Jesus. We, we've got, you know, the brothers and sisters of Jesus talking. But not one single time does Joseph say one thing that's quoted. Why? Because he doesn't initiate. He responds. He doesn't take center stage. He works behind the scenes. And he allows his obedience to speak for itself. Joseph's obedience teaches us that trust and obedience are inseparable. Faith and obedience, they're inseparable. You can't say, Jesus is the Lord of my life, and then refuse to do what he says. It doesn't work that way. Trust and obedience go together. You say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. What do you want me to do? I'm willing to do whatever you ask me to do. Why? Because you are the Lord of my life. If we don't first trust God, we will never surrender our choices. If we don't first trust God, we're never going to surrender our destinies to his purpose. The song says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be Happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Man, I want to be more like Joseph. I want the zipper across the lips when the tongue wants out. 
needs to just go back in there. Just let our lives speak for themselves through our obedience. Joseph, think about all that Joseph experienced and he was just faithful. He was just faithful. Isn't that what we want at the end of the day? We want us to just say, he was faithful. She was faithful. No matter, no matter what happens in our lives, no matter what those difficult trials are that, that we face, we just want to be obedient. We just want to be faithful. At the end of our lives, that's all that's going to matter. Trust and obey. For there's no other way. If you want to be happy in Jesus, you're going to have to trust and obey.